Hi everyone, my name is Amber. Welcome back to my channel or welcome if you are new here. Today I'm trying something a little bit different. This is a booktube channel in case you weren't aware. However, I am also very, very interested in true crime. So I wanted to find a way to kind of merge the two interests of mine because I'm fairly passionate about both of them. I love reading generally. I also love watching TV shows about and reading about true crime cases. And I've been thinking about combining my hobbies for a while. So what I've come up with is this new feature in which I talk about a true crime case and I give you all the details and I also talk about the books that I read in relation to this case. So today I'm going to be talking about a British serial killer called John Christie who was at large in the 1940s and 50s and also his neighbour Timothy Evans who was also caught up in Christie's crimes. I do want to mention before getting into this video that this is going to be a very sensitive topic. Obviously it's about a true crime murder case, a serial killer and I wouldn't recommend watching this if you're sensitive to any kind of gore, any murders, I guess, um, and you don't want to hear about serial killers. This is going to be a lot more adult than my usual stuff. So the two books that I read recently were John Christie of Ten Runnington Place. This is obviously non-fiction and it's basically a biography of John Christie's life and the murders that he committed. I also read Inside Ten Runnington Place, which focuses more on Timothy Evans and his backstory with his wife and how Timothy Evans allegedly killed his wife and was then hanged for it. I'll talk more about the two books later on, because now I'm going to give you some background on both Christie and Evans. I highly suggest that you go and get a cup of tea here because we might be here for a while. There's a lot to cover and a lot that I wanted to mention in relation to this case. Okay, so John Christie's bio. I figure we'll start with him because he's kind of the main one here and then Timothy Evans comes along later. So John Christie was born in 1899 in Yorkshire and he was one of seven children. He wasn't the youngest, but he was one of the younger ones and he really did not have a good relationship with his family. His father didn't treat them very nicely. He was allegedly abusive and would punish the children a lot and also John's mum and his siblings used to bully John. Alongside that John Christie was also bullied by his classmates at school. He was rumoured to have issues getting up so to speak and so his early school days weren't very nice for him. When he was 11 years old John Christie moved to a better school. He obtained a scholarship for maths which perhaps indicates that he had a very high IQ. He left school two years later at 14 and then two years after that he enlisted in the army for World War One, So he obviously did some training and then in 1918 John Christie was dispatched to France and shortly after his arrival there he was hospitalised for a gas attack which John Christie often said affected him permanently although the doctors don't agree with this so Christie said that the gas attack left him unable to speak loudly it left him partially blind for a while and also partially mute and a lot of people say that this is actually quite unlikely because he was dispatched shortly after this and it's very unlikely that he would have been dispatched if he had these injuries all these conditions. Anyway, so in 1920, John Christie married a woman called Ethel Simpson. The two of them didn't have the best marriage and unfortunately Ethel did miscarry early on and the two of them separated shortly after that. In 1923, Christie joined the Air Force. He didn't last very long. He was actually discharged only a year later and I couldn't find out why, but that's what happened. And then John Christie spent a lot of time in and out of prison for minor crimes. And by minor, I mean their not as bad as murdering someone but some of them were actually quite bad. He was in prison for theft, petty theft and also sometimes assault which obviously is not good. And then a few years later, for some reason, John Christie and Ethel got back together. I don't know why this is. I couldn't actually find out why. In those days, obviously, a woman didn't want to be single or on her own. So perhaps Ethel wasn't able to marry or find anyone else. And so she went back to Christie. This was in 1934. And in 1937, they moved into Rillington Place, which is the infamous house where all of the murders happened. They originally moved into the top floor flat, but then a couple of months later, I think they moved down to the bottom bottom floor because that was more desirable, it had its own kitchen and more, it was more spacious and it also had access to the garden which will become very important later on. So this would have been the perfect opportunity for John Christie to get his life together, unfortunately he did not. He kept visiting prostitutes and cheating on his wife with them and then of course later on he turned to murder. Of course shortly after 1937 World War II really kicked off and John Christie joined the War Reserve Police which were basically people in London who I think 
Frank patrolled and kept the order and things. And unfortunately, at this point, his background wasn't checked. So no one actually caught on to the fact that he had a criminal record and probably shouldn't have joined the police. So through his work, John Christie met a woman called Gladys, whose husband was off at war. And they had a very long affair that lasted until 1943, which by the way, is when the murders supposedly started. John Christie's victim was murdered shortly after this breakup. And this murdering spree went on to last at least 10 years. So the first woman who John Christie killed was a 21 year old called Ruth. John Christie said that he brought her home to have sex with her. And after the act, John Christie strangled Ruth and buried her in the back garden. Shortly after this, John Christie quit his job on the police and found another job at a radio station, which is where he met victim number two, whose name was Muriel. In 1944, John Christie took Muriel back to his flat and he claimed to have a some sort of remedy for bronchitis, which Muriel was suffer suffering from. This is also really important because it sounds as though John Christie pretended to have kind of cures and potions for all of these different kinds of ailments. And this will come into the whole Evans story later on as well. And it sounded like he tried to gain people's trust by pretending to be kind of an out of work doctor sort of thing, or at least someone who knew about medicine, which he definitely did not. So John Christie had Muriel inhale this mixture through a tube. And when she was distracted, John Christie connected this tube to the gas tap in his flat. And obviously Muriel inhaled the gas and fell unconscious. John Christie raped Muriel, then strangled her and then buried her in the garden as well. So everything seemed to settle down for a couple of years after that, or so people think. And John Christie didn't actually murder anyone else for quite a while. And then in 1948, the Evans family moved into the flat upstairs. So this is where I want to pause the John Christie biography and the John Christie story, because I want to give a bit of background on Timothy Evans and his wife, Beryl. So Timothy Evans was born in 1924 in Wales and he moved to London with his family. He had a couple of sisters and a mother and also a stepfather and the whole family moved over. As a child it's said that Timothy Evans had a lot of learning difficulties. He was very slow to learn to speak and he wasn't very good academically. It also didn't help because Timothy actually had a foot injury when he was a child and so he missed a ton of school for that because he was going to a lot of doctor's appointments and this is when he was eight years old so obviously he missed out on a a lot of schooling. So it is said that Timothy left school without the ability to read and comprehend written texts. In addition to this, Timothy was also someone who made up a lot of stuff. He was a bit of a compulsive liar and he definitely exaggerated to make himself look better. So he told a lot of stories and embellished them just to show off, I guess, and to probably make himself feel better as well. I think it was definitely a pride Thing as well. In 1947, Timothy married a woman called Beryl Thorley, who was very pretty, very popular, and that is what she was ma mainly known for. She came from a good family. After Beryl fell pregnant with her and Timothy's first child, they moved into Rillington Place together. The book, Inside Her Rillington Place, says that Timothy Evans was abusive towards Beryl and that the couple struggled a lot with finances. I think actually, having watched a few documentaries on this case, it's well known that Timothy and Beryl had a very very abusive and aggressive relationship with one another. Inside Terrellington Place definitely lays the blame on Timothy, solely on Timothy. However, it is told or written by Beryl's brother. So it's a slightly biased account. Anyway, so five months after moving into Terrellington Place, Beryl gave birth to baby Geraldine. Like I said, the couple were struggling with finances very early on now that they had moved out of their family homes. It didn't help matters when Beryl fell pregnant again in 1949. The couple discussed it or argued over it. Due to their financial problems, they decided that Beryl should have an abortion. And that's when John Christie comes back in. Like I said, he liked to pretend to be a bit of a doctor on the side. And he said that he would be able to perform an abortion on Beryl. In the autumn of 1949, Timothy Evans walked into a police station and said that his wife was dead. He told the police that he had killed his wife and he had put her body into a drain out of the front of the house. So the police head over to Temrillington Place and initially they couldn't find anything. They tried picking up this manhole cover, but there was no way one person could have done that alone. So they found Timothy's story a bit weird at that point. They searched some of the house, but they didn't find anything. But later on, upon another search, they did find the bodies of both Beryl and Geraldine. Like I said, Timothy Evans's confession was a bit weird because initially he said that he had killed Beryl accidentally by giving her a concoction to bring on an abortion or a miscarriage rather. And he said that he'd put her body in the drain 
the police couldn't figure out why he would lie about that. I also don't know exactly why he would lie about that. It's a very odd thing to do. However, it seems that after Timothy was told by the police that Geraldine was also dead, which Timothy did not seem to know, Evans changed his story. This time he said that a man called John Christie, his neighbour, was going to perform an abortion on Beryl because they were having another baby. Evans then said that what actually happened was he arrived home from work and John Christie told him that the abortion had gone horribly wrong and that Beryl was now dead. Christie said that he would take care of things and that he would send baby Geraldine to live with another family while things were sorted out and that Timothy Evans should go and visit family in the meantime. Apparently at the time John Christie wouldn't let Timothy Evans see Geraldine so Evans just had to trust that this man was looking after his baby. So after finding the bodies the police actually interrogated Timothy Evans again and they got another confession out of him. This time he admitted to killing both Beryl and Geraldine. He was charged with the murder and once again after the fact he blamed John Christie again and he insisted that John Christie was actually behind the murders. Evans is trial began in January of 1950 and John Christie actually acted as one of the witnesses in the court. Needless to say Timothy Evans was found guilty and he was hanged in March of 1950. So in Inside Ten Reddington Place, the book, the author thinks that Timothy Evans did do it. The author, like I said, is Beryl's brother. He didn't really see much of Beryl, although he did go over there a few times, but his family had moved away from Beryl. They left her alone in London with Timothy, which is a questionable decision and not something that I personally would have done if I thought that my sister was being abused. But the author does think that Timothy Evans is behind the murders and the fact that Beryl and Geraldine were strangled next door to a serial killer who strangles people was just a coincidence. So at this point you may be wondering how the police didn't notice the two bodies in the garden when they were searching the house for Beryl Evans. It's literally because they were shit. Basically the crime scene wasn't searched properly and no one noticed that there were mounds in the grass and that there were shallow graves in the back garden. Anyway, so John Christie had gotten away with this, Timothy Evans was gone and so he had nothing else to worry about. I guess he just went on his merry way. He found a new job, new neighbours moved in. At this point John Christie actually fought for sole use of the garden, he didn't want anyone else going in there and obviously we know why now but I think at the time the landlord just didn't care, he figured John Christie's in the ground floor flat, doesn't really matter, it makes sense that John Christie gets sole access to this back garden. Anyway, two years later in 1952 John Christie committed another murder. This time it was his wife. He killed her by strangulation. He went on to lie about her whereabouts. He said that she was visiting family, I believe, and then he went on to sell her belongings, including her wedding ring. He emptied her bank account. So perhaps he killed his wife at this point because he didn't have very much money and this was an easy way to get some. In 1953, things started to escalate and John Christie killed three women in a very short space of time. These women were called Kathleen, Rita and Hectorina and unfortunately Rita was pregnant at the time of the murder. So for these murders, John Christie used the exact same technique as before when he killed Muriel. He overwhelmed the three women separately on separate occasions with carbon monoxide. He knocked them out, abused their bodies, and then strangled them. And then instead of burying them in the garden with the other two bodies, he hid them in an alcove in the kitchen and then wallpapered over it. So after killing what people believe to be his final victim, Hectorina, John Christie left Rillington Place. He tried to sublet his flat to a young couple, but then the landlord learned about this subletting and he was understandably quite angry. He told the couple to leave. While he was over at the house, he also decided to let the tenant from upstairs use John Christie's kitchen because John Christie was no longer there. This tenant then discovered the alcove in the kitchen and the three dead bodies. He thankfully had some sense and he called the police and this is when the police started searching for John Christie. Christie was sleeping rough at the time and hiding out in cafes and cinemas but the police did finally catch up with him in March of 1953 and he was finally arrested. So initially in custody John Christie only admitted to the most recent four murders, the four women plus his wife but then later bodies were found in the back garden and John Christie admitted to killing those two extra women and also Beryl Evans as well. John Christie didn't admit to killing Geraldine Evans and people theorise this because his case was going to come out in front of a jury and he didn't want them to hate him. Obviously he wanted the jury to 
to come to a good conclusion and admitting to killing a baby would definitely alienate any jury. So in June of 1953, John Christie went to court and he was tried for the murder of Ethel Christie, his wife. He ended up pleading insanity, which basically admits that he did it, but he was insane at the time and the judge found him guilty. John Christie was then hanged in 1953 by the same man who hanged Timothy Evans. It's speculated that John Christie actually had more victims because the police found clumps of pubic hair that he had collected. Not all of the pubic hair matched the known victims. However, no other victims were actually traced, so it's not actually known how many women John Christie killed. So obviously this case is a bit of a mess. John Christie killed a bunch of women and it's entirely possible that the police could have stopped him sooner if they had conducted a proper search on the premises when they were looking for the bodies of Beryl and Geraldine. It also sounds as though Timothy Evans maybe didn't do it and he was wrongly hanged for the murder of his wife, baby and unborn child. The death penalty was actually abolished about a decade later, partly due to the issues of this case. So like I said, I wanted to quickly talk about the two books that I read to do with this case. First one, John Christie of Tenbrillington Place, was literally just a biography of John Christie. It gave me a lot of information. I think it was quite valuable as well. It also referenced other books that came out closer to the time of the murders. And so those books included some more information and interviews and things with people who were actually involved at the time. Inside Tenbrillington Place was a book that I didn't find find that useful, mostly because I found the author to be very biased. Obviously, if you think that someone is abusing your sister, or if you know that someone is abusing your sister, then you're going to hate that person, or at least I would hope you would. And it's clear that the author really did not like Timothy Evans. And I think his views and certainly the book that he wrote were kind of shrouded by that bias and he didn't give a very fair account of the entire case. So in my opinion, I think it's highly likely that John Christie did murder Beryl and Geraldine, whether intentionally or whether it was something to do with an abortion going wrong and then he got carried away with the strangulation, I don't know. But it's always going to be known as one of those cases that the police could have handled much, much better. To start with, someone could have looked into John Christie's criminal record and not admitted him into the police force. They could have also searched the garden properly and they could have not bullied a confession out of Timothy Evans and actually listened to his concerns when he said it was John Christie. I think for me, it's just a bit of a coincidence that there were two stranglers living in Rilling in place at the time and to me it seems highly likely that people took advantage of Timothy Evans in that he wasn't able to read and write properly, he did have quite a low IQ and also his wife and child had just died. Perhaps he was quite distraught at the time and didn't give a true confession. I hope you found this case interesting, I certainly do. I definitely think that the terrible police work needs to be highlighted and personally I find the discussion to do with Timothy Evans to be very interesting as well because of the case's impact on the death penalty. I hope you enjoyed this video i'm very much looking forward to doing more of these kinds of videos in the future i actually loved talking about this true crime case and connecting it to booktube i have many more ideas of cases that i could cover and talk about and books that i could read please do leave a comment to tell me what you liked about this video if you've got any cases that you'd like me to talk about also let me know i would love to look into some and also i want to know your thoughts on the case do you think timothy evans killed his wife or do you think it was john christie and also are you horrified by the terrible police work that was quite honestly rampant in the 1940s and 50s. Thank you so much for watching this video. Hopefully it wasn't too out there for you. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll speak to you all in the next one. Bye!